Don't you wish that uh, Joe could just lead the worship right before you preach all the time? I'd, I know I'd be a better preacher if that were the case. <laughs> I, uh, I am blessed, and the fact that uh, the Lord has blessed me with four, five, eight grandkids now, eight grandkids, and I have two that live literally right across the street from me. I think we got a picture of those uh, two guys. They're twins. Uh, they ac- actually, this is a, it's a fun picture, but... I, I was doing a wedding for a single adult that uh, I'd ministered to, and they wanted these boys, I don't know what she was thinking, but she wanted them to dress up like secret service agents and carry in the ring down. So they're, they're dressed up for a wedding. They marched in that way. But they live across the street, and, uh, they're, and isn't, it, um, isn't it just the grace of God? Of the, my, I'll just, I think my children all know this. The, of my three children, there was one... Um, who caused me to cry out to God uh, more than the other two combined and doubled. <laughs> Did you, do you have one of those kids? that um, th- Their dad was that child in my, uh, my parenting, and now that child works for me, uh, has a Ph.D. in apologetics, and lives across the street. And I'll tell you what, there were some dark, dark days when he was a teenager, where I just was crying out to God, saying, God, please help, I don't know what to do. But uh, now that son was watching me relate to his two boys. He said, Dad, I swear that you're nicer to my boys than you ever were to me. I said, well, son, there's a simple answer for that. I said, I like your boys a lot more than I ever liked you. (laughs) He he said, well, I suspected as much. I said, well, to clear out all doubt. Uh, The the child on the left is Emerson. He's he's, uh, two minutes older than his brother Logan. Uh, and I'm sorry, it's the other way around here. Emer- Logan is on the left. He is uh, two minutes younger than the boy on the right. Uh, they're fraternal twins, so they don't look anything alike. Their, their personalities are nothing alike. The, the boy on the right, Emerson, is a stud athlete. In fact, we actually ran, entered a 5K run the other day, just a, a little local one there in South Atlanta. But he came in first, his dad came in second, and I came in third. Uh, three, that was awesome. But he's a stud runner, athlete. His brother on the left, on the other hand, is not so good as an athlete, but he's a brainiac, just smartest, just scary smart. And he, he goes to bed at night and just reads these history books, and he, and he, and he loves to, he gets so excited about what he learned that he gets breathless. And it's not, it's not that he's trying to, you know, be smarter than everybody else, he just, he just loves to let people know what he's learned and to tell them things. And so one day these two boys are in the back seat of the car with their dad driving somewhere, and all of a sudden Emerson just shouts, ow! And... So my son Daniel says, Emerson, what, what's wrong? He said, Logan just punched me. And so he said, Logan, did you, why, did you, why did you punch your brother? And Logan said, well, Emerson just told me he didn't know what sin was. So I showed him. <laughs> <laughs> it's an object lesson. He thought it was a real teachable moment, I guess, for his brother. But uh, but but. but but as smart as Logan is, what he has to learn is sometimes there's a right thing to do, and then there's a right way to do it. And I want to talk to you in this, these moments about something that I've just been immersing myself in for the last year or so, and that is the ways of God. The ways of God. I said the other day that God is far more than a doctrine. If God is simply a doctrine to you, you're missing out. <laughs> He's a person. You relate to a person, not just to a doctrine. You fall in love with a person, not just a belief system or a worldview. Doctrines, as I said yesterday, they're important. But, but, but don't stop at the doctrine. Go to the person. The person about whom the doctrines are worked out. And God is a person. But, and because he's a person, he acts in certain ways. And he's very consistent about how he acts. And perhaps the most uh, important passage or famous passage in that is found in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. You know these well. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. By the way, I'll tell you what, as I work with church leaders, you, they don't, we don't really believe this. We really think that if something makes sense to us, God must be pleased to. My dad used to say, if he had a plan that made perfect sense to him, it probably wasn't from God. Because his thoughts are not our thoughts. And we're too quick to come up with a plan, an idea, and eagerly charge off and assume God's going to bless it. But I've learned this. With God, 
It's not just what you do that matters. It's how you do it. And you can actually do the right thing and do it the wrong way. And I found, by the way, if there, if, if, I, I find the secret to success as a leader, you want to do the right thing, and you want to do it the right way, and you want to do it at the right time. It's also possible to do the right thing too late or too soon. Things weren't ready yet. You did it too soon. You came to your new church, and you were trying to make changes too soon. It was the right thing to do. You just did it too soon. Or the opportunity passed by the time you got around to doing it. And so I want you to focus especially on the ways of God. And so it says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And what I, one of the things I've had to do is just to, to examine, again, how I'm doing things, how I'm ministering, how I'm preaching, how I'm leading. Because just because it's the way I've always done it doesn't mean it's God's way. Just because that's how I, I learned it in seminary doesn't mean that's God's way. I've got to go before God and say, how do you want me to lead these people? By the way, it's a fascinating passage in a, uh, Psalm 103 or so, and it, it says, basically what it says is that the Israelites saw the acts of God. Moses saw the ways of God. And the problem for a lot of us is we keep seeing individual acts of God, but we never make the connection. He, he does these acts the same way every time. And when you learn the ways of God, you come to know the character of God. You come to know him as a person. Did you ever wonder why the Israelites, uh, even though they kept seeing all those plagues, they saw the, the, the Red Sea parting, they saw all the acts of God, and then the very next time they had a problem, they worried and fretted and complained and said, let's go back to Egypt. Why, how could you witness all those acts of God and then still not trust him the next time you had a problem? It's because all they ever saw were the acts. They never learned about the ways. If you learn the ways of God, you'd realize he's a provider. Every time we've had a need, he's done exactly what we needed. The ways of God are that he provides, that he's faithful, that he's trustworthy. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people in your churches who keep seeing the individual acts. They've never learned to understand the ways. And so I want you just to, to look for a moment. I, actually, I wrote a, I've got a book. I wish it was out now. It comes out in April, The Ways of God. Um, and, 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 and so this is a very dangerous thing to try in 30 minutes to, to tell you what I've just written a book about. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at just two, two of the ways of God in these moments. But I, I really encourage you, if, you're going to, if, if you want God's blessing upon your ministry efforts, learn to do things God's way. Because I see a, a lot of very, very well-meaning pastors and church leaders who are working very hard. They love Jesus, they, they, they love the church, and they're doing everything they know to do, and then God's not blessing. And they come and they're bewildered, and they say, I've done everything I know to do. Why is God not blessing my church? Why is he not blessing my efforts? Well, there's lots of answers to that, but one of the reasons is because you're doing the right thing the wrong way. And, and the ways of God always bring glory to God. The ways of the world bring glory to the world. And what I keep seeing over and over again is the church trying to do God's work the world's way. And I'll tell you what, when you try to, you, but you say, but we're doing it for God. We're doing it for God. But you're using the world's ways to build the church, to glorify God. That doesn't work that way. God's not going to bless the world's ways, while you try to serve him. And I'll tell you something, as, I, as I've studied this and I looked at the ways of God, I'll tell you what, God worked me over. Because I, I, I and I, I don't think it's wrong to study leadership methods. I'm a leadership guru, that's my thing, is leadership. But I want to, every time I'm reading what the world says about leadership, I want to have my Bible in my other hand. And say, the moment this veer, veers away from the ways of God, I'm going with God. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what the CEO says, built his business. I'm going with God. And, I, and, and what I have found as I work with a lot of pastors and church leaders is we have no idea how much of the world has permeated our methodology. And yet we wonder why God's not blessing. We're doing everything they do at Disney World, but, but God's not working at our church. <laughs> well, because God's ministers do things God's way. 
and it glorifies God and he's pleased to bless it. So let me just point out maybe two of those ways just in these moments. But I, I certainly encourage you. And you know, one other, one other thing I would just say is I encourage you as you're ministering, as you're in 2023, perhaps you just need to just ask God to show you one or two of the ways of God. Don't try to overwhelm yourself. To, to just take one or two of the ways of God and say, God, all year long I want to just funnel through all my ministry up against your, the ways of God here and see, am I doing things the way God would? Um, because I'll just tell you this, I have no doubt if Jesus would just for some reason incarnate himself once again, and in and, and physical form, come to your church and sit down with you and you tell him what's going on in your church, he would not be bewildered in the slightest. And he would immediately know what you needed to do. And he would immediately address the issues in your church. And you would have hope and you would move forward. He knows what to do. So why is it we're not doing that? Why, why are we not hearing from him? Well, because we, we read a book somewhere and we think we know what to do. And, and God would say, well, it just better be leading you to do it my way. My way brings glory to God, and, and God is pleased to bless. Well, obviously one of the ways of God that we sang about this morning is God's ways are holy. And you have to start there. Because holiness permeates every other way of God. Everything God does is affected by his holiness. In Psalm 77, verse 13, it says, God, your way is holy. And that means it's, it, it's not like, it's unlike anything else that you know of in the world. That's why I say if you're doing things exactly the way a secular person would do them, it's probably not the ways of God because he's holy. It means everything he does is righteous. It means everything he does is pure. It's blameless. It's above reproach. And that's why, by the way, uh, the Bible can say some confusing things sometimes, like God will say, I'm angry. And we think, wait a minute, you know, he's angry. How can he be angry? That doesn't seem like a very godly, holy kind of thing to do. Well, it, it is a holy anger for God. God can be absolutely holy and still be absolutely uh, angry at what's going on. Now, our problem is we assume every time we get angry that it's a righteous anger too. And I'll tell you what, if you figured out honestly how to be angry and still stay perfectly holy, I'd like you to tell me how you do it. I just have found it's just best not to go there. Because when I get angry, all kinds of fleshly, carnal, prideful thoughts and attitudes start seeping in. And I start wanting to get vindictive. And I want to start hurting people who hurt me. And I want to, I want to put them in their place. And, and I say I'm doing it all for God. But only God is able, because he is absolutely holy, to also be angry at the same time. By the way, it's also why God can be jealous. It's a holy jealousy. I tell you what, if you learn to do things in a holy way, it may free you up to do some things you've never been able to do before without sinning. Um, his holiness permeates uh, everything that he does. Everything he does is done in a holy manner. And so I've got to ask myself the question, so can I say that everything I'm doing in ministry is done in holiness? That, it's, that what I do is not like the world does, but it's the way God would do it. And so when I preach, you assume if you're preaching from the Bible, it's got to be holy, right? But have you ever heard pride permeating a sermon where a pastor was bragging on what he had done and what he had accomplished and how much has happened in this church since I got here? And um, I'm just glad we're not back where we were under the former pastor. <laughs> and and uh, have, you ever, have you ever heard people putting guilt trips on their people as they preach? Can I just tell you that? One of the ways I know that something's from God or Satan is if it's guilt, it's not from God. Now, God will convict you, but when he convicts you of your sin, it's always to bring you freedom from your sin so that he doesn't remember it anymore and you're, you move on in freedom. But guilt, I'll tell you, it is hard as a pastor, is it not? Not to lean a little bit into guilt when you got people who should be at this meeting and they're not here. And they should be serving and giving, but they're not. And there's just these little subtle ways to just put them on a little guilt trip so that, you know, you nudge them in the right direction. Folks, listen, holiness won't let you start compromising and cutting corners to get the job done. By the way, 
can you preach and, and half of what you're using has been plagiarized from someone else and you're not giving credit? If, if, if you're not telling the truth, now, now I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate Mark because when he and I started speaking together, he told me one time, Richard, I'm going to use a story I've heard you, I'm going to you know, quote you. And he said, but this is how it works when you travel with me. He said, the first time I quote you, I'm going to say, as my friend Richard says, he said, the next time I quote you, I'm going to say, it's been said. And the third time, I'm going to say, as I always say. <laughs> I'll tell you what, do you ever get tempted sometimes to just, this is such a great quote, and I really believe it, I'm just going to take it myself, and they're going to, my people are going to think I'm as profound as C.S. Lewis was or something, you know, it's like, um, folks, I tell you what, the moment you begin to be tempted to be dishonest, and holiness is not keeping you in check, God's not going to bless it. Now, I'll tell you why it, it, I, it, it, this concerns me, because I know a lot of wonderful pastors working as hard as they possibly can, and it, they're, they're being worn out, and they're wondering, God, don't you love my church? Don't you love me? Don't you want to see people in my community saved? Why are you not blessing me? I preached my heart out. Nobody responded. God, why, why not? Why are you not empowering this? Again, there's... there's number of reasons he might do that but one thing you want to make sure you check the box was did i just preach god's way and that means i preached in holiness by the way how you how you pray can you pray in an unholy manner can you pray where you're kind of making an announcement i tell you what that bothers me when you do that you're basically making announcements in your closing prayer or you're praying to god as if he's I don't know, anything but an almighty God. Um, where you're treating him casually. Uh, you're not treating him reverently. You're, you're praying with pride. Have you ever heard people pray and it's basically a brag fest? Where God, I'm just so grateful that you've used me to do this. And under my ministry, this has changed. And, and our church has grown. And that's not holy praying. Folks, I tell you what, if you're going to minister, you better do it God's way. And that means holiness ought to permeate everything you do. I'll tell you, I'm just going to confess to you, um, because I'm not here to just point a finger at you. This is God, God's taken me through the, <laughs> the grill on this one. And I remember at one point several years ago, we had college students, I think at the time, we're having dinner, uh, it's, a, it's a holiday, like Thanksgiving or something, and we've just pulled out all the food, and my wife turns to me, I'm the patriarch there of our family that day, and says, Richard, would, could you, would you pray so we can eat? All the food's hot. We want to get to eating. But I, I'll just be on, I'm just going to be honest with you. I mean, it's a family gathering. It's a holiday. All my kids are home. And I've been loving it. And I'm joking around. We're teasing and bantering. And, you know, just that's what we do. We're having a good time. It's all in good fun. But we're joking around and poking fun at each other. And all of a sudden, I'm supposed to pray. And I'll just, I'm just going to confess with you. I took my joking attitude right into my prayer. And I'm actually poking fun at my kids while I'm praying. And when I got done praying, I opened my eyes, let's eat. And my wife is just staring me down. <laughs> and she kind of said, we need to talk. Well, well, at least I'm getting my food. No, we need to talk. And she, and my wife grew up Catholic. And they've got their issues. But, but my wife grew up with a reverence for God. And she, she said, what did you just do? I said, uh, well, I prayed. You told me to say grace. I said grace. She said, no, you just talked to God like he was a clown, and you did it in front of all three of our kids. If I were to ask our kids, based on the prayer your dad just prayed, how awesome do you think God is? They wouldn't have a very high view. Well, I was just saying grace. No, you talk to God. Now, I, I'm not saying, I mean, God's a loving God. God is, uh, God, there's a lot of joy to be found in God. But folks, I'll tell you what, I, I just, I made a commitment from that day forward. My, my kids know I like to joke around. They know I like to tease. But, but there ought to be something different about when I talk to God. And I'm not saying it's all sour lemons. There's a lot of joy when you talk to God. But just understand this, do you pray in holiness? Do you pray in such a way? See, we've gotten to this whole thing where it's like God's my best buddy, you know? He's my BFF. It's like I talk to him like I would some other person. No, but he's not some other person. He's holy. He's different than any other person you'll ever talk to. 
Your kids ought to just go quiet when they hear dad or mom about to pray because they know they're going to hear a conversation they never hear in any other way, other place. Dad's talking to God now. And when you stand in the pulpit and you pray, do your people listen to you pray and say, I just love hearing our pastor pray because it just we go places in prayer. I've, I've never gone in any other conversation. I, by the way, just even in dealing in conflict, I'll, I'll just be honest with you, I, I used to run a seminary, and, um, and at one point uh, our denomination made a decision that, that drastically harmed our school, and they just did it without talking to me about it first, without giving any notice, any lead time, just boom, you just don't have any of this money anymore. And um, it was just not the right way to treat a partner, and it was going to be put huge, huge burdens on me and our staff, and I, I just, I was mad. And I'm, I'm going to, I, I know that venting's probably not going to change anything, but it's, I feel like it's going to make me feel better anyway. And so I don't really have access to the guy who actually made the decision, but I do have access to a guy that works there around me. And so I, and I have his email, so I pull up his email, and I just, I just lay it out to him. What a stupid thing I think it is that they've just done. And how wrong it is to just arbitrarily make a decision, not even talk to me about it. And have you ever, have you ever written out a whole email and then you were hovering the, the, the mouse right over send? And in your spirit, the spirit of God saying, no, don't do that. And I'm hesitating. I'm like, I really shouldn't send this. I really should rewrite this. But I'm mad right now, and I want to send, and I sent it. And I'll tell you what, the moment I hit send, I'm, I'm just wishing I could just go in there and pull that out and hold it. How can I cancel? Cancel, cancel. It's too late. It's gone. And I realized in my anger, I had not been holy. And God does not honor unholy ministry. And I just regretted that. And, it, and I, in fact, I made a policy from that right then. I said, God, anytime I hesitate over send, I'm going to hit delete. That's just, if I hesitate, I'm just going to trust that's the Spirit of God trying to save me from unholy behavior, and I'm going to delete. Um, I saw that man about a month later. We were in the same city in a meeting. As soon as I saw him, as soon as we, I, we had a, a break, I went over and pulled him aside and said, listen, I'm so sorry. You, you deserve better than that email. That was, I was wrong. You, you didn't make that decision. He, I, uh, he disagreed with the decision as well. I, but I just said that, that was... If I'm going to ever build an organization God's entrusted to me, it won't be by unholy outbursts, unchristlike behavior. It's going to be because I led in a holy way. You might disagree with what I did, but you shouldn't disagree with how I did it. I should do it in a godly way. You might not have the same opinion, but you got, but I, but you got to say, but the way that Richard did it was holy. It was God-honoring. And I'll tell you what, you want God's blessing on your ministry. And I know entire churches that aren't being blessed by God because what they're doing is not God-honoring. Why would God empower and bless something that doesn't bring glory to him? Uh, get your church doing things God's way. And sometimes you just have to have the courage to say, folks, I, thanks for that, that suggestion, but folks, that's not how God does stuff. That may be how the world does. That might be how your workplace does it, but we're doing things God's way around here. And that means doing it this way. Well, one other one just to mention, that is that God also does things in power because he's sovereign. He's all-powerful. Notice uh, Hebrew, or Habakkuk 3. It says, God comes from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His brilliance is like light. Rays are flashing from his hand. This is where his power is hidden. Plague goes before him, and pestilence follows in his steps. He stands and shakes the earth. He looks and startles the nations. The, the age-old mountains break apart. The ancient hills sink down. His pathways are ancient. God is an awesome God. Everything God does, he does in awesome power. And that's why he's sovereign. Because <laughs> my dad used to always say, um, God doesn't make suggestions. He issues commands. God doesn't have to negotiate. He doesn't have to try to see if you warm to the idea. When God speaks, it's always a command. There's no wiggle room to try to figure out the way you want to do it. And everything he does in, is in power. I love, for years, I, I traveled with my dad. Nobody spoke with him as much as I got to speak with him. And we'd be sitting on the front pew, and 
people would pray things that weren't necessarily true, and my dad would, <laughs> he, he'd, he'd have to just make a whisper something to me. And I, I remember one time a, a guy was praying, and they're, and they're praying for revival. And so he prays, oh, God, come in power. And my dad leaned over and said, that's the only way he ever comes. What do you mean come in power? What's the alternative? God's going to come powerlessly this time? Folks, if God's in the room, it's powerful. And you've got to, but can I tell you something? I've been around a lot, a lot of leaders who lead struggling churches, who lead declining churches, plateaued churches. And it's hard to keep doing things assuming you serve an all-powerful God when you've got a handful of people in the room and you don't have very much money in the bank. And you don't, you don't even realize what you're doing, but you start downsizing what you believe God will do. And you start hedging things, even when you pray. You know, no matter what you pray, you, you always throw in that, that escape clause, right? If it be your will. So you never have to go out on a limb to actually trust God for anything, because no matter, if nothing happens, you can say, I guess it wasn't God's will. And I just find, I, I hear so much praying and preaching that, that you'd never know, listening to them, that their God was all-powerful, that he was sovereign of the universe, and he is the head of our church. How could, how could we ever doubt that when, when Christ, who rules the universe, is the head of our church, he's in the room, standing here in our midst, how could we not conduct our business with confidence? I'll tell you what, far too many people, they base their church activity on the money they have in the bank, not on the Jesus, the Christ who's on his throne. Uh, if the first question you ask is, can we afford it? Your church is being driven by your budget. First question ought to be, does God want us to do it? And if he does, we have absolute confidence he will provide for everything that we need. I, I, I have pastors all the time, they think so small, and then they wonder why their church is so small. Uh, that the, what they do is always assuming the least, try, doing the, the least possible, assuming the smallest response, and, and then, then that's what they get, a small response. And my, my, I, as I shared yesterday, my dad came to a church of 10, but he preached as, as if the God of the universe is head of these 10 people. What can God do with 10 people? Anything he wants. So when you pray, when you lead, when you preach, you've got, you've got to act like you believe that God is all-powerful and he's sovereign. I'll tell you, as my dad got a little bit older, he just got impatient with people that said they believed in an almighty God, but they weren't living that way. They weren't leading that way. And at one leadership conference, a pastor came up to my dad and he said, uh, Henry, you know, I, I've really been sensing, you know, what you preach today, I've really sensed God wants me to do that in my church. But he said, I've, I've just really been wrestling with God about that. And my dad, did just, it was, I guess it was a straw that broke my dad's back that day. He said, you've been what? Well, I, I've been wrestling with God. He said, my, my dad just said, who do you think God is? Who do you think God is that you can wrestle with him? Folks, I'll tell you something. On the earth, there's some people who tried some of them ended up with lifelong limbs as a result. There's no evidence that people ever wrestle with God in heaven. There are no wrestling matches in heaven. You know why? Because there you see God as he is. And the thought of wrestling with him appears just as ludicrous as it really is. But in this life, we don't know God nearly as well. And we actually have the audacity to think that an almighty God can tell us to reach out in faith to reach our community, and we can tell God we don't have the money for it, so we're, we're going to have to pass on his suggestion. Folks, if he's all, almighty and he's sovereign, wrestling, negotiating, delaying. My dad used to always say delayed obedience is disobedience. Once you know what God wants, Every second you wait to obey, you're living in disobedience. And I had to just pray, if he is as awesome as I keep telling my people is. By the way, if you, if you stand in the pulpit and you tell your people you're wrestling with God, even though you know what God wants you to do, what are you telling every person in the pews? They can do the same thing. Our pastor wrestles with God. Why wouldn't we? Uh, our, our, our pastor picks and chooses what he wants to do from God. Why wouldn't we do that? Folks, just be very careful of the example you're setting for your people. 
when you talk to God, is there a trembling in your spirit as you realize who it is you're talking to right now? Are you quick to obey? I'll tell you what, I, if I watched your ministry, would there be any evidence that you serve an almighty, all-powerful God? Now you talk about it. Well, I, I say he's almighty. Yeah, but what do you do that reflects the fact that you serve an almighty God? How do you preach? By the way, can I tell you something? Uh, I know that a lot of people, even in Southern Baptist churches, have kind of gotten away from altar calls, public responses. Now, I realize there's lots of ways to get a response. I'm not saying you've got to do the traditional, we're going to sing, you know, three verses. If no one comes, we'll, we'll close. Like, but, but, but I'll tell you what's happened a lot of times. There's a lot of preachers that don't really believe God's going to do anything in the congregation, and it gets embarrassing to stand there for three or four verses while nobody walks the aisle. So let's find a more discreet way to kind of cover ourselves so it's not awkward when God doesn't do anything once again on another Sunday. Can I just tell you something? When you, when you stand before your people and you say, God has just spoken, as we've heard from Joe, what, once God has spoken, I n don't say there might be someone here who wants to respond. <laughs> Folks, Almighty God just spoke. I know everybody with any brain in his head is going to want to say yes to what they just heard. So we're going to sing. And don't say, if someone comes. Don't be wishy-washy. You serve an almighty God. Say, as you come, as you come, I'll be here to pray with you. Stop being wishy-washy. If he is almighty, sovereign God, act like it. Preach like it. Invite like it. Challenge like it. Pray like it. How big, just, just watch a video of you preaching last week or praying. Then ask yourself, on a scale of 1 to 10, with God being awesome, what would people have thought of God after they listened to me preach last week? How awesome would God have appeared to them? Now I'll just tell you the last thing just with that. I, I, I'm not telling you, you you go looking for a sign and wonder. But I'm telling you, is there anything happening in your church that can only be explained by Almighty God? That you just can't say Richard just works really hard and he's really been paying a lot of visits and he's been following up on all the prospects that Mark talked about and, and, and so that's why we're growing. No, is there something where your people just shake their head and say, I can't, I mean, we love our pastor, we know he works hard, but I can't explain what's happening here. People just showing up that no one's even invited. People driving by and pulling into our parking lot. And people getting healed. And, and, and right when we needed this amount of money, out of the blue, that exact amount of money just shows up from someone who doesn't even go to our church. How do you explain that unless it's an all-powerful God? Folks, I tell you what, when your people start to get a sense, this isn't just some religious ritual that we go through every week. We're coming into the presence of Almighty God. Hold on to your hats. Anything can happen. I don't care if there's 10 people. 10 people plus Almighty God, it's limitless what can take place. Now, act like it, lead like it, preach like it. Well, I, I was 31 years old, and I was called uh, to be a seminary president. I was way too young to do that. In fact, this, but I, I found out later that the trustee or the, the faculty all had revolted. They all had lodged a formal protest to the board of trustees to say, this, I mean, Richard's a nice enough young guy, but he's going to kill this school. He's way too young. And he'll, he'll, he's just going to, he's not ready. He's not seasoned enough to lead this school. But, but they called me, and I, I came, and I, I know how they feel. I'm, when, I was, when I came to the seminary, I was the youngest employee on the payroll at the school. And I'm the boss. I'm the president. There's nobody getting paid. Everyone that I'm administering is older than me, and a lot of them are Ph.D. professors and IMB missionaries and and that, that think that they know a lot better than I do about what's going on. And, and so I get there, and I'm just praying, say, oh, God, just don't let me sink this ship my first year. At least, you know, just help me, God. But I'm looking at this, this organization. Everything's down. Money's down. Students are down. Morale is down. Everywhere I look, there's a lawsuit sitting on my desk the first day. There's a, there's a person that needs to be fired at the seminary, and she's, got a, she's copied her lawyer to say, if you try and fire me, you're, I'll see you in court. And that's my first day in the office. And I'm, everything I'm looking at is like, Lord, where do I even begin to try to help this school? I'm so inexperienced, but God, I know that you're an all-powerful God. So just, God, show me what you can do. 
and give me the courage that even if it scares me to death, when you tell me to take a step into the Jordan River, I'm just going to take that step. Well, short story of that is that God uh, began to do a work, and, he, and, and all of a sudden I'm approached by some, some Baptist men in Texas, and they said, we just feel impressed. We need to go help you. What, what can we do? And they, they thought they would build some uh, dormitories for us. I said, you know, that's not really what we need. We, we really need a, a classroom space and, and so on. And, well, let me, let's, let's talk about that. And they came back. Well, yeah, okay, we'll do that. They said, now, the way it works is that we don't provide the money for this. We just we provide the labor. We'll pound the nails. You've got to buy the nails. And I said, well, I'd like to suggest a new uh, a paradigm for you. How about if you help us raise the money and provide the labor? They said, we've never done that before. That's just not our policy, but we'll, we'll, let, we'll talk about it. And they came back and said, well, we'll walk with you, and we'll try to raise what money we can. And So things are happening. And, but, I'll, but I'll never forget, the, it, it just step after step, it would look like no more money. Or the government would say, we're not letting anyone come in, come in from the states to work with you. All of our volunteers being held at the border. And over and over again, all these people, you know, when things are going well and everybody's like, yeah, Richard, wasn't this a great idea that we had? And then the moment there's a problem, it's like, Richard, are you sure that you, 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 you haven't made a mistake? <laughs> it was all me, you know. And, and, and I'll never forget the day we, we, have, we have just enough money. We're at the point where we're going to put the trusses on, this, on the roof of the building we're building. And we've got to rent a very expensive crane. And it costs us hundreds of dollars a, an hour to rent this machine is being brought on our property. So we've got to just lay those trusses as fast as we can. Monday morning at 9 o'clock uh, or 8 o'clock, the, 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 the clock starts ticking. And then we're just, whether we can use it or not, it's, we're paying for it. And it, we, we're literally, we'll clean out every cent we have. And so Monday morning, I get to work early. I get out of my car, and, and the seminary is up on a hill. We, yeah, we got a picture there, right by the Rocky Mountains. And uh, the winds could just be fierce. We, we literally had someone lose a, a car door one day in our parking lot. The wind caught the car door and blew it right off the hinges. We had the front door blown off because the wind would catch it and just blow it off. And that morning, the wind is just blowing so hard. People are, if you don't hold on to your baseball cap, uh, it gets blown into the next province. And, and so people are walking in like this, holding their hat in their head and, and walking inside. And we know full well there's no way that we're going to be able to hang trusses. These are guys are all, re most of them retirees. Can't hang trusses with wind blowing trusses uh, on the crane like that. And so about 40 men, get all lay people, they all walk in. We, they always have coffee and a prayer, and then they go out to work. And I'm just heavy hearted, because I know if we got to wait all day with that crane sitting there, we'll blow our entire budget, and the crane won't have even hung one truss that day. And so I don't know what to do. I've never faced this before. You know, every step, people were always like, okay, Richard, is this where everything just falls apart? Is this where the disaster strikes with this young president? And I'm praying, God, help me. I, 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 I don't know what to do. And so they're all looking. They know they can't go out there. So one, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll never forget this. He's a, he's a layman, been a working man all of his life. He's retired. He's come up there to help this little school in Canada. And he, and he looks at me and he says, well, Brother Richard, I think you just need to pray and ask God to stop the wind. Now, I'll tell you something. I prayed for God to bless my food lots of times. <laughs> I, think I'd even, I think I'd even prayed for God to be with us a few times until I learned better than to do that. But I'd never ask God to change the weather. God, you know, give us safety in travels. God bless this to the nourishment of my body. I've got 40 men looking at me saying, well, Brother Richard, we know God wants us to build this building. And, and we're, we've come all the way here, and we've only got this week to do it. It's got to be this week. And so let's just pray and ask God to do it. And I'll tell you what. I've never, ever had my faith on the line so much. And all these 40 men are saying, well, how, Brother Richard, how powerful do you think God is? I'll tell you what. I'm like, oh, all right, well, let's pray. And I, but I, I just like, how do you pray when there's 40 men waiting to go outside and see that the wind has stopped? You couldn't even hold, have a hat on your head when, you, when they walked in the door. So I prayed. I prayed a long prayer. I wanted to give God as much time as possible. <laughs> to do whatever he's going to do. You know, it's like, and I'm praying for missionaries and that, every attribute of God that comes to mind. I'm not giving God any more time here. And then it gets to the closing, and I've got to say, am I going to put some wimpy little if it be your will at the end of this? Or am I going to put my faith on the line and say, God, I'm pleading with you. I know how powerful you are. The winds are nothing to you. 
And I'm going to just ask God, I believe you. Do this. I'd never done that before. Never prayed a prayer like that before. And I realized everything everyone said about me as a young, inexperienced president could all come crashing down in my head here if this week goes south on me. And so nobody moves. Nobody wants to go outside and find out my prayer life stinks. <laughs> it's like they all just sort of stood there for a few minutes. And then finally that, that man that, that did got me going, I'll tell you what, the, the face of some of our Southern Baptist lay people, he throws his hat on his head and says, well, I say we get to work. And he just starts marching to that front door. And a couple of his buddies throw on their hats. They start walking out. On, uh, to, I'm just being honest with you here. I didn't walk out there. I figured when they get to the door and the wind is still howling like it was, I've got to come up with some theological explanation why sometimes God c calms the storms inside us but not outside us. <laughs> you, know, it's like, you know, baby God, I'm like, what do I say when they come back and nothing happened? I prayed the best prayer I had and, and nothing. And so I'm, I'm literally, my mind is racing. What if it doesn't work out? Which is I, so pathetic preach about a powerful God all the time. And I wasn't living like he was powerful. And, um, and I'll tell you what, all of a sudden, the guys who got to the front door, all of a sudden I heard these, some men's voices going, Hallelujah! Praise God! And after I heard about four or five hallelujahs, I started making my way out there, and I stand before you and tell you the absolute truth. You could have licked your tongue and held it out like your finger, and you would not have felt a trace of wind. And 30 minutes before, you couldn't keep your hat on your head. And these men just said, let's get to work, boys. And they got that crane fired up. They started hanging those trusses. And the next day, their, their, their second last truss, you could start to feel the wind starting to pick up. And they're pounding those nails. They're getting the last one in place. And uh, they got everything in place just in time. And then the wind was just as fierce as it had been that Monday morning. I'll tell you what, when those volunteers packed up to go home at the end of that week, these gruff, tough, seasoned, working men, they all looked at me, and one by one they came up, and they've got tears streaming down their face. And they said, I've been in church all my life. This is the first time I've ever seen. I've heard how powerful God is. I heard about God doing a miracle in Jericho, doing a miracle with the plagues of Israel. I've never seen one before. God's awesome, and I got to see it. They thanked me for it. I'm like, I'm, what are you thanking me for? I was almost a rank unbeliever there. But praise God. And I'll tell you what, I don't care what else I do in ministry the rest of my life. I'll always be able to look back and say, I don't just believe that God's all-powerful. I experienced the power of God. I saw it. I lived it. It's not, I didn't read it in a theology book somewhere. I was in the midst of it. And no one will ever be able to take that away from me. And I just long for the next time God chooses to, to, to work and power my life. Well, I'm going to take just a moment just to pray for you. And folks, there's a lot of ways of God. His ways are loving. There's a lot of other ways of God. I've talked about two of them. Powerful. His ways are always done in power. And he's sovereign as a result. And his ways are always holy. Folks, if you've been frustrated, perhaps with some of your ministry, you might just want to Say, God, let me just look at the way I've been serving you. The way I've been serving you may not be bringing you glory the way it ought to. Whatever adjustments I need to make, God, let me not just do what you want me to do. Help me to do it the way you want me to do it. All to the glory of God. Lord, thank you for being a God who's so patient with us. You know that we love you, but Lord, we don't know you as well as we should. We talk about your power, but we often don't live and lead like you are an all-powerful God. And so, God, I pray that um, as we lead our churches, that we would not do church work the world's way, but we would do it God's way, in a way that brings glory not to ourselves, but to you. And, God, I pray that uh, as people watch the way that we talk to you, the way that we obey you, the way that we serve you, they would realize that we serve an awesome, holy God. And I would pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.